Welcome to the State of the Nation. My name is Mike Sham. Uh, we have uh, we keep on looking ahead at the South African condition, which at this point is all heading towards the 2024 general election and provincial government elections. We've had a slew of politicians through here from all of the uh, opposition parties. Hold thumbs, we might even hear from the ANC soon. But really what often counts are the analysts. And uh, today we've got one of my favorite analysts, somebody that understands numbers particularly well, and that's Kaya Satole. Kaya, welcome to welcome back to the State of the Nation. Good to have you back. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, or good day to everyone who's watching. Yeah, they watch it mm. weird times the of the day. night. Yes, eh? yes, we, yes. We've got data on Electricity, you probably, <laughs> you know, hopefully, when it's around. Mm. Yeah, so Kaya, um, let, let's kick off with, uh, you're on the State of the Nation. This is uh, quite soon after our president gave his State of the Nation. I've got to tell you, I want to live in the country that he lives in. What did you make of his, uh, of his stump speech that uh, masqueraded as State of the Nation address? I, I think it was probably what you may refer to as a predictable uh, speech. And what made it predictable is that if you had asked anyone to sort of then say, okay, <clears throat> what does a State of the Nation address on the 30th anniversary uh, since 1994 looked like and the answer would simply have been it's a nostalgic one and the nostalgia is really trying to evoke the emotions of yesteryear the emotions of what got us um, to, to the polls in 1994 in particular and of course what you wanted what you would have expected is that great contrast between where we were until we as a party came in and what progress we made as a party <coughs> when we were given the opportunity so the nostalgic angle was essentially the script that anyone would have written. And of course, the question of how you then frame that nostalgia was going to be particularly important. And they did go back to the playbook that they've used before. So many years ago, I think it was probably GCIS or one of those government agencies that came up with this idea of, you know, um, the mock-up or you had a, 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 I don't know if the word mock-up is the right one of, you know, what does a child that has grown through this particular process look like? What are their prospects? What have we done in order to aid them through the transition? I think the name may have been Tandy many years ago. It was quite a while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, a common element of the playbook. And what works for it is that um, essentially it sort of creates a reference point for some of the things that the ANC has done well in relation to the social wage in particular, because I think that's probably the one thing that everyone can acknowledge that they've done well, whether they should have done it in the manner that they've done it. When you talk about the funding aspect of it, that's when you'll know what the problems are. But that's probably where they tick most of the boxes mm -hmm. in relation to how we've enabled someone whose prospects would have been otherwise very bleak in order for be able for them to be able to sort of have an opportunity to live. So whether you look at what we do when a person is born, access to health care, what we do when a person is below a certain age and below a certain income, child, child grants or foster care grants, the fact that we now have universal access to basic education. So you see, you're taking mm. all the right boxes mm. in, in, in relation to saying, <clears throat> how does a social wage enable a person born into this democracy to stand a chance of reaching a certain age? If you look at child mortality rates that have gone down, and even if you look at you know life expectancy. So in relation to those things, those are the, clearly the lower hanging fruit for the government because they've done them. Now, whether obviously they should have executed them in a manner that they have is a question of semantics, but the things that do exist. So mm. for me, it wasn't surprising that they went back to that particular playbook. And of course, it tells a good story up until a particular point in time. Mm. And it's that particular point in time where he then has to acknowledge that, well, in spite of what we've done in order to ensure that Dinsalo has made it this far, we now also have to acknowledge the challenges that have emerged since then. But I think when a person listens to the story, what looms out is the fact that Dinsalo exists, first and foremost, and that's what you wanted to leave out there. And that's how it was crafted by his speech writers. If I had been asked to uh, participate in that process, I probably would have gone for the same playbook mm. because, you know, of the realities of what you're trying to put out there. Yeah. When you don't have a message. future, you've got to Yeah, yeah, that's what past, it is. So, so the nostalgia for me was clearly the, the best chance of actually putting together a speech that resonated with people. Now, of course, you then have to distinguish between the responses that are going to come from different aspects of society. So let us park the political opposition responses because obviously they have a particular uh, mandate that they have to um, you know, put together in response to their speech. When you then look at what an ordinary South African listening to that speech may have thought about or say, well, actually, <clears throat> in relation to 
where we were and what has been done in relation to it in Solo. Yes, there have been things that have been done remarkably well. And what I've said in my News 24 article in particular is that, look, let us look at it as, you know, the initial mile of Dinsalo's life story has been supported um, by this huge investment in the social wage. And obviously, the definition of the social wage, according to National Treasury, it would be, you know, school nutrition program is an aspect of it. Access to health care is an aspect of it. Access to education is an aspect of it. And obviously, the grants themselves are an aspect of it. So there's been a very big investment in the social wage. And what that then does is that it evokes the emotions of those that are probably uh, the primary beneficiaries of the social wage are those that would otherwise not have been able to get onto the economic bandwagon for many reasons, either because they're historically unable to access the education system, so therefore post-1994, if you're 40 years old and didn't have a degree, you're not going to go into a university because there's a new government here, for example. So there's been a lot of citizens that have benefited from that investment in the social wage. And that, of course, is the, 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 the accumulation of those investments then enables a person like Dinsalo to then say, look, at least I was given an opportunity. The problem uh, with that speech and the problem with the ANC's um, first 30 decades in power is what I refer to as the middle mile. And why I call it the middle mile is that, you know, at the start of the journey, you have a particular transition point. So from the grant system, the transition point happens when you reach a certain age. So obviously you as a 21-year-old or I as a 30-year-old do not qualify for that particular wage. Um, there's also a transition point in relation to access to education. So basic education expires at some particular point in time where they reach metric at the age of 16 to 17. Thereafter, you transition to a system where the protections are not the same. They're not guaranteed. And the big question is that in that particular middle mile where she then has to essentially reach a form of social and economic autonomy for about 40, 45 years, what has been done in relation to that. So the transition should be that if you are going to say to me, you've given me access to basic education, that education should be the springboard for me to transition into higher education if I decide to pursue higher education. That that, that basic education should be the springboard for me to transition into the world of work if that's what I decide to pursue. So then the question must then get asked that, well, what do we see at the point of that transition? Do we see Tinsualu using all of these things as a springboard into a better life, as a springboard onto economic autonomy? In other words, being able to earn an income that means that she, does, that she no longer needs the social wage protections that she used to have. <clears throat> and that's where the picture is quite bleak. And the president touched on it in a bit to say, well, <clears throat> far too many Tinsualus are called neat and you know the need cut categorization they're not in employment education or training which means that that investment that you made in the first 16 years is not yielding a particular dividend now that particular problem is multifaceted in nature in that obviously for as long as she cannot transition to higher education or the world of work the question then becomes how does she manage her life how does she live for the next 20, 30 years until she transitions back into the social protection mechanisms when age um, uh, 65 or whatever the case might be, then says you can access pension. Right? So that's the problem that you have. And that in that middle mile, far too many of the things, far too many of the investments that are necessary in that middle mile have not been made. And why that's particularly important <clears throat> is that you have created a Tinswalo who's a citizen who's been aided by the state for the, let's say 25 years, well, yeah, you know, 25 to 30 years. So she's been aided by the state in that initial mile because of what we've done in order to enable her to live. But Dinsualo's story is incomplete when she does not become a citizen that can aid the state. And a citizen that can aid the state is a citizen that says, look, thank you for the opportunities you've given me. I'm now leveraging those opportunities to start my own business so that I can, you know, be a taxpayer, be an income earner, you know, generate resources that can then be invested back into the state in the forms of taxes, for example. And then those taxes then get reinvested into another Dinsalo, the second generation or the third generation. So the reality is that if there's no investment in this middle mile, you then compromise the, 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 the impact of the investments that you make in the social wage. And what that means, for example, is that when we say that there's an investment in the social wage, and I tell you that, yeah, I'm 12 years old, I receive a child grant, or I'm taking care of an orphan, so I receive a, a foster care grant. The reality here is that when that grant arrives, 
firstly, it's not as scientific as we'd like it to be. So South Africa's grant system doesn't come from the position of saying, why does a 12-year-old that lives in Matadiele with the resource uh, 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 issues that exist there, with the infrastructure resources that exist there, what does that person need in order for them to be able to live through a 30-day period? So what type of food do they need? You know, what type of other resources do they need? So a scientific process would say, this is what that person needs, so therefore this is the value of the, uh, of the grant that this person gets. South Africa doesn't have the resources for that, so we have a, a, met, a method that works backwards. It says, how much do we have in resources, and then divide by the number of people that qualify, right? So that's the first limitation there. But the greater problem with that is that even if we reach a consensus to say, look, 600 rand is a right number, or 1,000 rand is a right number, the value of that 1,000 rand now gets diluted by the fact that when it arrives in your grandmother's hands and it's supposed to be a pension allocated to her because it's a pension allocated to an individual, she then has to cater for Dinsalo's needs because Dinsalo doesn't have a job. Dinsalo has no other form of an income. So you're now actually diluting the impact of even that investment in the social wage because it's now being spread too thin. So if you then went and visited that grandmother or the 12 year old child at the end of the month and say, look, as a state, we understood that your spectrum of needs, basic necessities was as follows. We gave you a particular grant at the beginning of the month. Let us see how you spent it on actually fulfilling all of those particular needs. Then you'll find that she spent too much of it actually sponsoring me as a Dinsalo, which means that even the things that we as a state may have said, she needs these things in order to survive a month. It then turns out that she's actually not being able to access all of them. So you now diluted the impact of the social wage because you haven't invested in the middle mile. And that's been the story of the ANC's failings in the past 30 years. Yeah. Now, um, there's been a lot of analysis about, you know, the usual words that will come up in uh, in any of Cyril Ramaphosa's speech, apartheid a thousand times. First it was Tumamina, though. Remember, first it was I mean, all yeah. Tumamina. But, I mean, yeah, especially in the last couple of years, you know, it's it's all been sort of like state capture, like it was somebody else's fault. And, yeah. and, and you know, apartheid, as if it, yeah, all of the, the buzzwords. The one word I didn't hear once was taxpayer. He seems to, uh, there seems to be no acknowledgement of taxes paid and no recognition for those taxes paid. Mm. And this seems to be, this sort of dovetails with your middle mile. Yeah, the, maybe he defers that conversation to his um, finance minister. So it's a fundamental problem. And I think what makes it a fundamental problem is that in all responsible societies, and when I say responsible societies, <clears throat> it's a society that acknowledges that you may, A, as a particular political party, take the view that we want to position ourselves as either a pro-poor or pro-capitalist party, whatever choices that you make. So the NC positions itself as a pro-poor party. Um, I saw a tweet that alleged that the D is pro-poor, and I was quite surprised that anyone said that about them. But nevertheless... Oh, well, it, I think you can make that case quite strongly, because pro-poor is to make a, a wealthier economy. But you see, that's, the, that, that's precisely the issue here, in that in the ANC's formulation or presentation of what it means to be pro-poor. It simply means that everything that they say and everything that they that, that seem to be saying must only prioritize the poor, right? And the moment they start talking about the segment of society that actually funds that pro-poor agenda, then it suddenly sounds like, ah, you're favoring capitalists, you're favoring the middle class. And political parties proactively take the stance that we don't want to be accused of that. So this is why parties stay away from saying that, well, actually, in order to protect the middle class, we're going to do this in relation to taxes. Because if, for example, he comes out and then says, look, the middle class have been squeezed by the cost of living over the past couple of years. These are all these things that have happened. So therefore, this is the relief that we're giving them. That relief immediately sounds like there'd be less resources to go around. If there are less resources to go around, then it will be, oh, it means that the poor are going to be screwed because there's less mm. to, to spread around. So a party that doesn't want to deal with those anxieties simply pretends that the middle class doesn't exist. It simply pretends that the question of funding is not as important as it needs to be. So you can come out and have a very strong message that says that this is all the pro-poor policies and these are all the pro-poor uh, <clears throat> ideas that we're putting together. But what I say is that, you know, South Africa is going to spend the next couple of months listening to a lot of completely unfunded manifestos yes. because for every single manifesto, 
it will resonate with because South Africa is, you know, dominated by um, a lot of uh, 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 citizens who are either income poor or just generally poor. So income poor is that some have a job, but it's not getting them very far. So um, everybody wants to resonate with that electorate. And very few people have the courage to then say, well, actually, in order to ensure the sustainability of this pro-poor agenda, what are the pains that you all have to uh, 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 put up with? in the short term or in the medium term so that this investment in this agenda is sustained in the long term. And if you avoid that conversation, it will eventually become a reality. And that's a reality that we're already seeing now. So the ANC has engaged in a passive austerity program. I don't know if South Africans are aware of this. And what this passive austerity program is that, what it does is that um, National Treasury comes up with a directive that goes out to everyone to say cut costs. Just cut whatever needs you need to do. Just cut something, right? Unless it's blue light. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I think the reason they can't cut the blue lights is because they don't know who to send the email to. Uh, <laughs> but everyone else has got a director general that they send the email to. And the issue that emerges from that is that <clears throat> you have two types of audiences. You've got the incumbents. So let's say it's the people that are already employed within the state, for example. Let's use the example of doctors. <clears throat> so you've got doctors already employed within the state. These are incumbents. And then you've got the prospectors, those that want to be employed, right? So um, you end up with this interesting dilemma in that the state says that you must spend less, right? But it's also a state run by a political party that has a very intimate understanding of the power of mobilization amongst you know, unionized workers, for example, or people that are able to <coughs> get together. So at the same time that the state can say, we do not have a budget to hire new doctors, it is the same state that will then say, oh, in relation to the doctors that already exist, this is the wage increase that we're giving them. So that confusion is like, wait, hold on. Do you agree that you need doctors? Do you agree that you're understaffed? And there's consensus there that, yes, we'd like to have as many more doctors within the system as possible. So if you want more doctors, why aren't you hiring them? It's like, oh, actually, the resources have already been not only allocated to the doctors within the system, but we're also giving them an increase. So the confusion is that, but doesn't, that doesn't make sense. But the reality here is that in South Africa, the bargaining power of the incumbents is much stronger than the position of the prospectives, right? So if you look at um, the consequences of the government coming out and say, look, actually, we've got a problem this year in that we do not have enough budget uh, of a budget to fund all the doctors that need to be in the system. So in order to absorb some of the prospectives, we're going to have a wage freeze for the incumbents. That's not going to work mm. because then the unions, they how will say, hell no, yeah. you're not going to do that to us. So the bargaining power of the incumbents is so much stronger that you have the prospectives being left out. We're seeing the same thing happening with NESFAS because NESFAS says in Parliament in November, I think it was the last presentation in November, <coughs> they say, well, we've been told by National Treasury that we need to cut budgets. And the consequence of us cutting the budget is that 87,000 students for 2024 will be unfunded. And I think they predicted around 125,000 students for 2025, which is next year. So interestingly then, you have the same question of, well, if National Treasury said you need to cut the budget, could you, as a financial aid scheme, for example, say, okay, cool, we have 1.3 million students that we're funding every year, and these are the allowances that we're allocating to them every year, and this is how much it costs to accommodate them. So because Treasury has said we must cut the budget, well, suddenly that allowance of 1,000 rand is going to be an allowance of 800 rand. Could they ever do that? And the answer is simply no. Because now suddenly the incumbents, people that are already part of the system, <clears throat> that are already streaming an allowance, will say, but no. You gave us, you promised, you created an expectation mm. of that particular allowance, so now are you cutting it? So the only way to maintain the budget is firstly to hope that some of the incumbents transition out of the system that they pass, or you simply do not absorb any new perspectives, and that's where the 87,000 number comes from. So what makes it a passive austerity program is that it is simply cutting out perspectives from entering the system, even when they qualify and then simply hoping that the incumbents either transition off or something else happens to them. So why that all matters is that you only enter into an austerity program, whether it's passive or otherwise, simply because suddenly reality has come back to ask the question of, well, how are you funding 
all of these um, interventions? How are you funding all of these mechanisms that you've tried to put together as a state? And the reality here is that if you do not build, if you do not invest in the funding of those particular initiatives, eventually you're going to run out of money. And because we are approaching an election, <clears throat> the passive austerity program works for the ANC in that you're not going to hear of a union saying, yo, the government has uh, dismissed 10,000 of our members because there was no budget, right? So the government is targeting those that do not have that same bargaining power, yeah. the ones yeah. that do not have so the voice internally out, because yeah. 87,000 students who have never been at a university, there's no way you're going to get all of them to mobilize and mm. say, we are, we, we're going to strike because, well, they've never been part of any system. What's the basis um, for, put, for getting together? They don't know each other. They can never know each other. Uh, similarly with the doctors that are outside of the system, they're scattered all over. So you're not going to see a mass mobilization of 10,000 unemployed doctors chewing up in parliament, for example, and mm -hmm. say, actually, we've been exiled out of the system. So that is the weak uh, bargaining power that outsiders have, which simply means that ahead of an election, the government will make the call that if we're going to have a, 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 an austerity program, let us protect the incumbents and simply not onboard any new people into the system. You're seeing the same thing with the social relief of distress grant in that they keep refining <coughs> the, the qualification criteria in order to cut out, right. uh, yeah, to sort of weed out the system. Now, obviously, there was a good element to that in that some of the people never qualified in the first place. Yeah. But I think when you then listen to some of the data that I think Black Sash in particular puts together, it just looks puzzling that so many people suddenly don't qualify because it's either the system was compromised from the beginning or government has said, well, actually, we need to exclude as many of these people as possible. So there's an austerity program. We're still in the passive yes. phase. Wait until the elections happen where suddenly you have to then be, do it the way that circumstances demand that should yeah. be done. Now we're gonna go. We're gonna we're gonna go on to the income side of the of the balance sheet at some point. But at this stage, let's stick with the expenses side of the balance sheet. And that is, uh, uh, are you going to help uh, President Ramaphosa find a pen to uh, sign his NHI? Me. <laughs> <laughs> What's your view of the NHI? So I think the NHI, I've I, I realized it's a remarkably complex piece of legislation given the many intersections that are necessary in order to make it work. And I think also it hasn't helped that yet again, government has been quite poor in really articulating what the big idea is and making sure that many more citizens understand what's going on out there. So what you end up with when you interact with people, it sounds like, oh, they're just gonna take over the entire healthcare system. You're like, oh, okay, then what? What are the implications? What does it all mean? Um, and I think it's been quite unfortunate that there's just a very, very limited understanding of what really the big idea of the NHI is. That's the first issue. The second one is that a few years ago, the state said it was going to write pilot programs, run pilot programs. And the pilot programs should have been the basis for understanding what the limitations were, what the key issues were, and how those issues are going to be resolved. And those pilot programs should have then become the primary communication tool to society to say, okay, this is what we wanted to do. We then went and tested it, and we found out that this is what works and this is what doesn't work. And that buy-in from society is quite important because people need to understand what is being done, particularly in relation to something <coughs> that affects them so, um, uh, so directly. And the reason it's a very important conversation is that if you screw this up, I mean, if you get this wrong, people may lose lives, you know. Mm. It, it's not like you and I deciding that, oh, should we have that particular, you know, tax mm. rate or that. Mm. This is essentially something mm. that if it goes horribly wrong, you know, the, 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 the healthcare system is far too fragile. It's far too important for us to be tinkering with it, which is why those pilot, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, those pilots were supposed to be that important. I think they were initiated in the time of uh, Zolim Kiza when he was still mm. the health minister. It is difficult now to find a concrete response from the state that says these were the results of those pilots. This is what we learned from those pilots, and this is how it informed whatever amendments we made onto the initial conceptualization of that bill. It's very difficult to get that. It also hasn't helped that suddenly we all have to confront the question of what exactly does a healthcare system comprise of? You know, what mm. does it look like? Um, so. There are those that operate hospitals, for example. There are those that operate medical aids. There are those that administer mm. these things. Now, what does the entire spectrum of healthcare system looks like? And what does it mean when the state says that we're rolling out this? What do, I mean, do, do medical aids cease to exist? W what happens? 
Uh, do private hospitals cease to be private hospitals if they can no longer prevent anyone from access? What does it all mean? Mm. And I think there's been a universal struggle to really give a full, comprehensive, very clear picture that says this is what it is, that's what we're trying to get to, and this is what it's going to take for us to get there. And when you then hear that the president has decided to sign, you then say, okay, cool. What happens after he signs? Uh, what, what changes first? Uh, what, what, what happens in the first year of this mm. particular uh, 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 process? Um, does the moment I hear that he's signed, do I then say, thank God, I'm canceling my debit order for medical aid? Is that the responsible thing to do? Do I know what that means? And even, let's face it, the, 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 the private uh, providers or the private role players that should still be in a position to explain that should he sign, this is what the consequences are, they're not giving us this information. So I haven't heard from a medical aid to say, okay, as you've heard in the news, he's just waiting for a pen. If he finds this pen, this is what it means. You must continue contributing or you should no longer contribute because this is what the implications mm. are. I haven't got that communication. I don't know if you have. Yeah. So even those <clears throat> that should be helping us get it to a better understanding, they either aren't doing it or they're th doing it through the whole lobbying system, which is a conversation between them. I yeah. still don't know what the implications are for me. And if he, if it's, uh, I always remember, you know, American presidents, the very last thing that they do uh, before Inauguration Day, they sign all these pardons. So mm. they find the pen and then yeah. they pardon whoever they want to. Uh, uh, Bill Clinton pardoned Mark Rich many, yeah. many years ago. And I do not know whether if he finds the pen the day before we go into a general election and he signs this NHI bill, I don't know what the implications are for me. I don't know what the implications are for you. Yeah, and, and I don't think he understands what the implications are to himself because he's so. going to have uh, <laughs> legal challenges up the wazoo. Uh, yeah. He's going to have to use all those lawyers that went to the International Court of Justice. Uh, you're going to have to keep them on retainer because he's going to fight uh, cases. Yeah, it, it'd uh, be a very difficult one, but um, there's also the question of, well, what does it mean for something to be signed in South Africa? I mean, mm. we've seen um, yeah. uh, uh, steps before where the president uh, announces unequivocally that this is what's going to happen, this is when it's going to happen. It gets done and then nothing changes. Yeah. So will the NHI be different? I don't know. Yeah, so it, it, it could look a lot like ETOLs, you know, but just on a, on a, on a far grander scale. I um, hope not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's, you know, we said we were going to come to the income side of the balance sheet. Mm. Um, and I do understand this was sown and not a budget. So it's, a, it's a slightly different animal. Mm. But uh, I suppose what we're seeing in South Africa is from a political perspective, there seems to be absolutely no plan mm. to grow this economy mm. or even an understanding of what happens when one grows an economy. Mm. Do you think the ANC have just completely given up on the idea of growing the economy or improving the economy. I mean, they say things like electricity. They say things like, I don't know, Transnet, we're going to fix it up. But outside of that, fixing up what's broken, there's no nothing there. There's no national... I mean, I know uh, uh, that useful idiot, old Trevor Manuel, mm. you know, created the National Development Plan. And I was with him last weekend. It looks very... Well, he's done chilled. quite well out of it, isn't <laughs> it? But he wrote the plan. And, and, yeah. and the plan was... was in a big way to to try and sort of make South Africa a more attractive business um, environment. Yeah. Uh, but that seems to have, have gone off the radar completely, mm. the, you know, the plus side. Do you think the ANC just has no plan? Do you think they just have no interest? Do you think this is a willful destruction of the economy? <sighs> When you look back um, over the past 30 years, I mean, 30 years is a sufficiently long enough period for us to be able to sort of evaluate what's worked and what hasn't worked. And I think what a lot of people would argue is that during some of those early years, there was some element of economic momentum. Uh, if you look at the data that happened, it perhaps, the, the, let's say, the, call it the first decade, of maybe first a decade and a half, mm -hmm there seem to be improvements going in the right direction. Mm. Now, uh, a lot of those improvements may have been as a matter of just good fortune. So yes. if there's a commodities boom and you're a resource-rich country like South Africa, you're going to participate in the upside one way or another. So well, we didn't with the last one, but the point it, is well made anyway. So what would have happened in the initial boom is that 
because you had so many of the uh, I don't I don't know I don't know if you want to call them the pillars, but the backbones. Uh, mm. uh, structures of the economy that were functioning, whether it's the logistics, whether it's the energy, it meant that when the opportunities did arrive, you could immediately piggyback on those and, and benefit. And that's what I would say probably defined some of the big growth that we saw in those particular years in that um, if there was an opportunity for South African resource companies, for example, to meaningfully participate in <clears throat> you know whether China's boom or whatever the case might be, there were none of these self-inflicted impediments mm. that limited our, part- our yeah. ability to participate, right? Now, that also occurs at the same time where the definition of work is evolving, the definition of workplaces is evolving, and their focus on what economies do and how they do it is evolving a lot. So if the world economy had become, as you know, labor-intensive as it used to be, then would say, look, whenever somebody says that there's economic growth, there's economic boom, it means that people are being employed because mm-hmm. an economy is labor intensive. Economies are no longer labor intensive, they're skills intensive, which means that we now have this very unfortunate turn of events where even if I said tomorrow there's going to be, you know, 5% or 10% economic growth, it is difficult to map that onto the capacity to employ. Yeah. Because if let's look at how financialized the economy has been, for example, in that South African banks can uh, uh, generate record profits tomorrow overnight because of exogenous uh, factors that have nothing to do with the question of how many people are employed. So if you look at, for example, <coughs> um, interest rates being uh, one of the primary sources of revenue, it simply just requires an MPC announcement that yeah. says that interest rates are now X, Y, Z. So if the banks were the proxy for economy for the economy. Well, of course, they're growing because they're making more money. Mm. So it would sound like, oh, the economy is growing, but that does not require them to employ a single additional person. Mm. Only the person who changes the rate in the computer. Yeah. And, and even now, computers are now doing it without our yeah. intervention. So the problem that you would now have is that I don't think our country and perhaps many other countries out there sort of have an understanding of how to ensure that that economic windfall associated with those moments <clears throat> of you know um, economic momentum across the globe that we should be participating in i don't know if you find a way of ensuring that we maintain a correlation between those spurts of um, momentum and our p- capacity to uh, uh, meaningfully participate in it in that you know absorbing more people into the workforce for example so it then simply means that there's now a disconnect uh, so when people say that, uh, why do you need to do in order to grow an economy, they inevitably look at the numbers and like, oh, it says that, status says predicting that <clears throat> there's going to be 1% or the World Bank says going to be 2% or 3%. Mm-hmm. But that no longer has much meaning for mm-hmm. South African citizens because uh, you saw during the post-COVID trampoline, I call it the post-COVID mm-hmm. trampoline because during the lockdown, the data, uh, all the data fundamentals went completely off kilter. So of course, mathematically, um, the season after the the, 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 the COVID-19, everything looked like it was on the way up, but that did not translate into a growing economy. It amounted to a correction more than mm. anything else. You also have this strange phenomenon of how the numbers or, you know, the essence or, or rather the mathematics of the economy interfere with this conversation in that you can have a, 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 an economy whose numbers say, oh, we are on the upward trajectory or we going, we're growing up on the basis that some of the big inputs are simply changing. So if, for example, you are a company that exports goods and services, or, you know, involved in the whole forex value chain, exports and imports, the exchange rates may go up or down with, you can sell the same units that you sold last year, but the numbers look very different. So if you sold the same units this year that you sold last year, it means you did not need to employ more people this year to produce those same amount of goods. But the numbers that you're reporting in your balance sheet say, oh, no, we've got 10% up, we're 15% up. So suddenly then the question is, well, what, what are these numbers saying about the size of the economy? Because it's simply saying that in the calculation of the effects of what we do, it sounds like we're 10% up, but the economy is exactly the same size that it was last year because you sold the same amount of goods this year that you sold last year. You just happen to have been very fortunate enough to be selling them mm-hmm. in a market where the value of those transactions changes due to yeah. exogenous factors. So sometimes the math itself doesn't help because imagine 
if stats say came out and said that we grew at five percent for the past five years every single political party the NT would be like, look at how good we are mm. we're growing at five percent every single year and no one would look behind the underlying numbers and say but what does it mean what drove that growth was it actually substantive economic activity that was absorptive in nature, absorptive in the sense that more people are required to produce those goods, or is it simply a matter of the mathematical gimmicks of economics? Yeah. Because if that's what you have, where are we going? Yeah, but one must say, because obviously that, that accusation gets thrown a lot at the gear era, Yeah. right? And, and uh, I know that was the wave that, that, that probably carried the, you know, the tsunami that, yeah. that carried uh, the, the dreadful period for South Africa in was to say, yeah, we may have been growing and rich people got richer, but it didn't help poor people much. Mm. But the, well, the statistics yeah, show that it did. It did. And Remember even what we were talking about earlier on in the financing of the middle mile. Because, yeah. because at the end of the day, if that growth generated more taxes that were invested in the social wage, then that helped poor people. Of course it does. That's reality. So one must distinguish between saying it didn't help poor people versus that it did not create employment because those are two separate dimensions. So you cannot argue that the growth in NESFAS, for example, over the past 10 years, or even in the growth in the SASA grants was not funded by something, it was funded by something. Of course. So because many more poor people that needed those resources have been onboarded into the system, it means that it helped in one another. Right. Now, the substance of the help of the assistance is a secondary matter, but it's, it's a strange argument to say that, no, the poor didn't benefit from that way. Yeah, it because, is. A- I mean... Where did the taxes go? The taxes were, yeah. in fact, they are disproportionately p- spent on investing in the social wage rather than yeah. investing in future infrastructure. Yeah. That's now, what happened. Now, I've been uh, fortunate or unfortunate, uh, whichever way you look, to, to speak to people across the spectrum of political parties. We're heading into a general election, so I'm having a wonderful time. Everybody accepts my invitations to come and sit here, except for you. You're very popular. To, I'm very popular, but I have to chase you around the world, and we'll get to that interview point later. Interview with my cricket and my tennis. Yeah, I interview you. For those people that don't know, Kaya Satole goes to more international sporting events than that guy with the one tooth, right? You are the guy. I mean, my word, in my next life, I want to come to <laughs> Kaya Satole. But Kaya, um, let, let's talk politics for a second because yeah. we're heading to, to a general election, um, you know, and it's politics is economics. Politics is either war economics. Those are really the only two functions of, of politics. We yeah. do seem to want to go towards war in that we're keeping some uh, interesting bedfellows um and uh but let's 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 first talk about the political parties and you know obviously uh they each one of them has a politi- has an economic implication yeah um firstly we've spent a lot of time talking about the ANC and its legacy mm. and, and state of the nation they're the incumbents they're going to uh, get the largest chunk of the votes in the next election, but it probably heading towards a, a falling short of an absolute majority. <laughs> what do you think? I hear a little snigger, and I'm uh, curious to hear what that snigger means. The data so far has not convinced me that the end is going to lose its absolute majority. Um, I think... When we look at the trends, uh, there were, what, 57.5% in 2019? It depends on whether you look at 20, 2019 or 2021 yeah. because, yeah. you know, does the South African vote differ that much between general and national elections and the data doesn't show that? Well, I mean, let's look at 2016, for example. 2016 was probably the first time where there were, like, big losses for the NC. Yeah. They lost the city of Johannesburg. I mean, they lost the Western Cape many, many years ago, but 2016 was what a lot of people regarded as like the moment where suddenly it's like, oh, yeah. actually, we finally got to get rid of them. And then it became quite clear that the voting patterns across the country aren't very linear, right? So if you look at what we tend to see in some of the big um, economic hubs, because I don't want to say the big provinces, because then the definition of big province yeah. is very different uh, to the definition of big economic hubs. Um, I think the other political parties tend to spend a lot more resources in those areas. So I know the DA spent a lot of money in the city of Johannesburg in 2016 because it was a big target for them. I don't think they'd spend the same amount of money in Limpopo, for example, sure. where they're not even the official opposition anymore because the mm-hmm. EFF is, right? So there's a first question of are the resources being spent in the places where the, the, the votes can swing the fate of the election? And the one possibility 
is that if these political parties um, that are trying to dislodge the ANC replicate the model of old in that they focus on just the big uh, voting hotspots, it may be very good resources that have a muted impact because, well, the result was always going to be that the NC wasn't going to win Gauteng anyway. Um, but they might have then said, well, let us uh, uh, focus our resources on the rest of the country. <laughs> so even if they lose Gauteng, they still emerge as the victors. So I'm curious to find out whether these other political parties are investing enough in finding the swing voters and then getting them to come out and vote. And my worry is that Unfortunately, and it's a peril of democracy, there are far too many voices out there. And in the multiplicity of voices, it becomes difficult for me to imagine that a voter who says, look, I used to vote for the ANC and now I want to switch. And the reasons I'm switching is because the ANC is failing in this six, seven or eight dimensions. That is the party that is addressing those dimensions that matter to me, so therefore I'm going there. Right? I'm struggling to see the uniformity of the message or the ability to be very clear as a voter that, oh, if I'm going to abandon this party, then that's the party that addresses the reasons I'm abandoning this particular party. The one thing that everybody says should be the one reason uh, voters abandon the ANC is the energy crisis. Oh, the problem with that is crisis is that it is so deep. No one who stands in front of you and says that we're going to fix it in six weeks or six months should be taken seriously. Mm -hmm. It will not be fixed in six weeks. It will not be fixed in six months. So you also then have to caution these other political parties around um, selling these completely um, well-intentioned but completely uh, uh, impractical ideas because I think voters will, will, will see right through that. They'll be like, Firstly, if this thing is so easy to solve, is it not in your interest to actually force it to be done even before we go to an election cycle? So by the time we go there, we're like, the reason we are here is because that party, even though they're not in government, were able to get us there. Now, obviously, it's very difficult to do a lot of things when you're outside of government, but you have to ask yourself the question of how believable is the message that you're putting out there? And is it believable to an extent that it forces those that would otherwise not have voted for you and those that would otherwise have set out the election and those that would otherwise have voted for the incumbents? Is the message strong enough to say to them, it's the time to shift and it's the time to move across? And I need to hear all of the manifestos first and foremost. I think we need to synthesize all of them and then say, well, actually, if there is a voter who is saying, I want to vote because... I want my vote to have the ability to effect X, Y, Z, which is the party that resonates greatly with the voters. Now, my other worry is that <clears throat> the ANC probably has a strong core that will vote for the ANC even in the middle of a hailstorm. Hell yeah, even if Jacob Zoom is a candidate. Yeah, yeah. and that's millions of, of voters. What the ANC benefits from uniquely is this deep sense of attachment that its core members have to the party. It's a legacy that, you know, this is the party that got us somewhere and this is the party that we've, this is the only party we've ever known governing mm. uh, 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 because obviously what happened before 1994 was definitely not governance. Um, so this is what we know best. And if somebody is going to convince us to switch, we need to see what exactly it is that they're going to do better and that what it is that they're going to do differently. And that is the burden that all these new political parties carry, the burden of convincing the voters to switch. So you've got that core constituency of the ANC. I do not imagine that a person who has only ever voted for the ANC and will only ever vote for the ANC will listen to any of these manifestos and say, actually, I'm switching because of what I've heard. There aren't enough comprehensively compelling offerings out there that get a hardcore ANC voter to say, actually, it's my time to switch. Then you've got the new voters that are necessary in order for these uh, political parties to stand a chance of dislodging the ANC. So I think also the DA has probably got its core constituency, people that will vote for the DA regardless of what Helen does or doesn't say over the next couple of weeks or, or the next couple of months. 
Um, and the EFF has probably found its core. I think probably one, one, one and a half million core EFF voters. Whatever happens, they'll vote for the EFF. Mm. So we now know that what will turn this election is the question of the marginal voters, the ones that are sufficiently interested in the question of what, wait, what did you say? Oh, yes, now I'm going to do. Rather than those that say, yes, whatever they say, my party is still the one best place to execute on that. So that's the core constituency. So the target is obviously the ones that are voting for the first time on the basis that, you know, they're engaging with the uh, electoral system for the very first time. There are those that are actually planning on participating for the first time. So it's people who have qualified before, we, we know, unregistered, and even yeah. when they register, they don't show up. So you've got the people that will participate for the first time because they feel that it is now time to leverage um, you know, that, 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 that instrument that they have, the one instrument that they have in most cases, in order to effect a change. So when we listen to all these manifestos, I'm always curious to find out that did somebody who had never voted for before <clears throat> wake up, listen to this particular presentation and then say, that's where I'm going because those things that they say they are going to address are the things that matter to me. So therefore, that's who I'm going to go for. And it is going to be remarkably difficult over the next couple of weeks, not only to launch these manifestos, but to then be in a position to go and cascade them. Or translate them to citizens at a very granular level because you know all the manifestos is a big mm, yeah. um, TV show for two or three hours, um, but that it on its own doesn't say, oh, I'm going to vote yeah. for them in three or four months' time. Then there's a question of when the ANC shows up on door to door and they say something else, will that citizen who may not have been able to listen to the two-hour manifesto of the EFF or Rise or the DA, will that person say, oh no, 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 actually, no? I don't believe you guys because that other party told me exactly how they're going to do it better and that's who I'm going to go with. So you need to then imagine that when people then engage with political parties on an ongoing basis, do those messages remain so central mm. to the prospective voters' mind? They're like, yes, even though the ANC did come to do the door-to-door, -door, I'm still sticking with their alternative because I actually now believe that they can address this issue much better than what you guys are saying are. So it's going to be a remarkably difficult campaign for these particular parties because it's not only a question of we engaged with 10,000 community members. It's a question of we convinced 10,000 community mm -hmm. members not only to abandon what their previous persuasions were, particularly for the new parties because obviously they're new to the ballot, uh, Action SA, Rise and Zansi. You have to persuade people to abandon their previous persuasions. And then you have to have a, offer them something compelling enough for them to say that on the basis of what these guys said, I'm not only going to go and queue up on election day, but I'm going to actually then endorse them because I believe they can address the issues that matter most to me. Yes. Yeah. Now, the one thing that I can say, if you, you know, and I have sort of like, you know, as this platform continues to grow and I'm now sort of like looking at things even closer than what I've looked at before, those new parties are not sort of built in the image of cope, mm -hmm. you know. They, they've, they've in fact learned from those errors, it seems to me, and they've been on the ground and they are speaking to uh, voters with a clear answer for those questions. It, the work feels different, if mm. I could put it that way. Look, it is a remarkably expensive exercise to try and replicate the ANC because the ANC's grassroots, uh, grassroots uh, mobilization is embedded in communities. Mm. Um, I think you would struggle to go to any church, random church in the middle of, of anywhere, and ask everybody in the church and find that no one is an ANC-affiliated mm. uh, person or an ANC voter. Essentially, the ANC has got a voice in every single community structure. Uh, whether those voices are prominent or not, it, it, it has, it's, it's embedded itself, itself into communities. And remember, the key aspect of this is that you must socialize the political message. It shouldn't be a once-off, two-hour manifesto. It should be something that is so... Um, uh, embedded in the fabric of the narrative of the conversations that we have that people then say, oh, I understand it because mm -hmm. you cannot risk um, it simply being a once-off conversation, a once-off message, and then they hope people remember it later on. 
So the reason the ANC socialization of its message is so easy to do is because it's got so many people that can say something that have engaged with it and then, you know, instinctively can speak on its behalf, whether they're speaking in favor of it or, you know, mm. against what it does. It's easy to then say, we've got this particular issue, this issue, the ANC has done this or the ANC hasn't done that. So there's, there's, you can have a complete conversation about a particular issue and the ANC's um, usefulness or otherwise in relation to that message. For every other political party, it's a bit more difficult, the socialization aspect, which means that they have an enormous hurdle to overcome that how do we, if I just send to you, go and chill at, you know, a chill spot, whether it's a church or whatever the case might be, and just listen to the nature of the conversation and then say if a topical issue comes up um, and people talk about the political dimensions of it, will there be someone sitting there who says, oh, no, actually, in relation to uh, the GBV problem, this is what that party that's never been on the ballot, that's never participated in a general election, this is what that party says, and this is what that party would do in our community if they had to come and try and solve it. Um, because what you want is that you must have enough of those ambassadors to be able to then remind people that something has been said about mm -hmm. this issue by this particular party. So if this is a, an issue that matters most to you, then this is a party worth considering. So it's a long-term socialization message. It's not mm -hmm. just a, a question of we had a manifesto, so people must vote for us. Nah, it's not that simple. Okay, so in uh, conclusion, do you see uh, the ANC holding a majority? At this stage, I believe the ANC will hold a majority. I just do not believe that the other political parties, as divided as they are, have put together a compelling enough narrative to mobilize the disaffected voters. And when I say the disaffected voters, the ANC, it's 10 million. Let's say it's 10 million core uh, voters. If they think the ANC is at risk of losing power, they'll show up one more time to say this is the party that must remain. So the challenge is to mobilize the disaffected um, the challenge some parties may think is to try and win ANC voters of the ANC, but I wouldn't spend a single cent on that. I just don't think any of them have got the resources to try and convince hardcore ANC voters to abandon their party. So the focus is on the disaffected. The focus is on those who are perhaps young enough to not have any sense of attachment to old uh, uh, politics or you know legacy politics and then say, oh, if this is what is necessary in order for me to get there, and this is what I must do, that's what the resources must be spent. And so far, because the messages themselves are a, a, a bit too all over the show, I have a fear that many more citizens will then say, yeah, actually, I couldn't find one voice or a, a, a range of voices that resonated with me. And that's why perhaps I want to touch just briefly on the question of this idea of a multi-party compact. And I think the, 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 the philosophical thinking behind it is that there will be many more voters who say, well, if I put up a dashboard of manifestos, uh, manifesto one, uh, six of 10, I like. Uh, manifesto two, I like four or five. Manifesto three, I like seven out of nine, as it were. So if I am very clear that I want all 10 boxes to be ticked, then not a single party ticks all 10 boxes. But if these three parties say to me that if you give one of us your votes, we will work together in order to pursue this particular thing, then I can say, OK, fine. If the three of you promise to work together, it means that all my 10 boxes or all my five boxes are ticked. Then therefore, I can back um, one of the parties that's part of that alliance. And that is what that M M M M MPC was supposed to be communicating a a as a message. We saw one iteration of it, I think, in KZN yeah. uh, a couple of a few months ago where the DA uh, retreated uh, in order to then get its own uh, voters to endorse the IFP. And they were very clear that, look, in relation to this, if all three of us are on the ballot, the ANC, let's say the ANC is at 40%, we, the two of us are at 30%, the ANC will emerge as the victors. We all agree that we don't want the ANC, so therefore let us withdraw one candidate and get our voters to then back uh, at one candidate so that we get 60%. I'm just simplifying mm. the maths there. So um, if you're able to articulate that to the voters, then voters may say, oh, okay, cool. Because the two of you are going to work together, it will mean that once I've, 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 I've voted for one of you, those things that matter to me are going to be addressed by you as a collective. So that is what that multi-party compact is supposed to be articulating to the voters. I think the difference is that, you know, uh, the EFF, for example, says we've got seven cardinal pillars. So everybody who's a member of the EFF knows that these are the seven things that this party wants to pursue. So 
they've got like a full list, a non-negotiable list. Julius insists it's non-negotiable. Uh, when I asked him about it uh, a few months ago, he said, we'll just never uh, 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 compromise on those cardinal pillars. And the reason I had raised it with him was to say, look, in 2019, you had the golden opportunity to capitalize on the land question. It was the most topical thing. And still, it just it, 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 was never, it, it was never concluded. So the question was, when you're now engaging with new voters for whom the issues are completely different and the issues you know, are, 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 are unique, what is this message <clears throat> that you position to them that convinces them that even though um, when there was a golden opportunity in 2019, we didn't get this across the line. This is what will be different the next time. And you just said the cardinal pillars are negotiable, which I found to be an interesting proposition given the evolution in the electorate. I mean, we cannot pretend that the people that are going to be voting for the first time in 2024 are the same as us who voted for the first time you know, in the mid-2000s and the people that voted in 1994. So you have to somehow embrace the fact that the electorate is not static. And if the electorate is not static, how do you still appeal to as many of them as possible, rather than limiting yourself to saying, well, this is the three or four things that we're all about, and if you don't like them, go look elsewhere. That multi-party was a good idea, but Stian Eisen was the face of it, wasn't he? Yeah, look, we've had uh, many discussions on this topic. Kaya, sadly, we've, uh, you know, there's definitely part two loading. There's, uh, we're going to have to talk about a whole host of other things. But uh, for today, sadly, we've, uh, we're going we're gonna to end it here. Um, this is obviously a, a ongoing story. Things will change dramatically over the next couple of months. Um, and, uh, you know, as the story develops, we're going to get you back to talk more. But it's wonderful speaking to somebody that understands especially the economic implications of the things we're grappling with every day. So, Kaya Satole, thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, keep going to sporting events, except for when I need you. Yeah? <laughs> but, uh, and I'll live my life vicariously through you. To everybody that's joined us on the State of the Nation, thank you so much. Please subscribe to the channel. And if you like us, become a member um, and, uh, and help support the channel. Uh, on behalf of the State of the Nation, thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you again the next time.